When my biography of Natasha Rambova first appeared 18 years ago, it received some excellent reviews, but it also revived an avalanche of controversy for the fact that it dared to propose that the wife of Rudolf Valentino was both his intimate lover and his artistic muse. She was the most hated woman in Hollywood, declared the reviewer in the New York Times, whose sweeping statement betrayed the fact that he would like to have seen her remain as such in a popular but falsely created niche in history as a meddlesome harpy, dismissed as nothing more than the girlfriend of Ala Nazimova, who was ambitiously linked to Rudolf Valentino in a marriage of convenience that would further her career in Hollywood at the expense of his. In order to logically present my case and establish Natasha Rambova as an important artist in her own right, worthy of reevaluation, and as a woman who was the object of Valentino's spiritual and physical affection, I had to deconstruct the rumors that had imprisoned the famous couple ever since the book Hollywood Babylon first appeared in 1975, with its farrago of fact mixed with a lot of fiction. The author of that book and its sequel, Kenneth Anger, set out to recast many of the idols of Hollywood history by presenting them in a new and uncomplimentary light, with the authoritative air of one who had been a bit player in an early Hollywood production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the former child actor turned avant-garde film director attempted to expose the peccadillos of Hollywood's rich and famous, lacing his stories with a clever yet vicious and ironic humor that made an indelible imprint on the image of film culture. His work overshadows the less flamboyant and more scholarly accounts of cinema history and biography. Feasting on Dead Celebrities has become a highly successful publishing endeavor ever since then. But its entertainment value threatens the legacy of the relatively new art form of the cinema, whose authentic chroniclers must separate fact from fiction, history from hearsay, truth from theory. In Hollywood Babylon, Anger declared that Rambova and Valentino had never consummated their marriage, that Valentino and fellow actor Ramon Navarro were lovers, and that Navarro was murdered by an Art Deco dildo that, Ru uh, that Rudy had given him 45 years earlier. All of these claims I felt I disproved in my own book, but it has been difficult to dislodge the colorful lies that survive in proportion to their own audacity. But I did not come here to Turin to fight old battles. Others are here in this august assembly ready to present new material that will reinforce my stance on the Valentino marriage and shed new light on the character of Natasha Rambova and Rudolf Valentino. Instead, I came here to look more closely at the artistic influence of Natasha Rambova, examine the reasons that compelled her to pursue the artistic course she did, and divulge some interesting facts that I was prohibited from including in my book when it was published. In her fascinating and scholarly book, editor Galen Studlar wrote an essay titled Out Salome, Salome, Dance, The New Woman and Fan Magazine Orientalism. There she showcased Valentino's movie The Sheik as a miscegenation drama wherein a white woman is violated by a man of color, an Arab. She points out that this film appeared in America at the same time as discussion was brewing over women's newly emergent sexual desires, while wave upon wave of immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe were flooding American cities. In 1921, uh, the 1921 uh, film was uh, an amazing box office success, The Sheik, and it further catapulted Rudolf Valentino to stardom. This was in spite of the fact that reviewers had dismissed the novel upon which it was based as a fictional shocker for flappers and a salacious fantasy formulated to titillate the new woman. Natasha Rambova is recorded as disapproving of the Sheik as a vehicle for Valentino. As we saw in the documentary this morning, she labeled it as trash. It could very well have been due to the controversial rape scenes included in Edith M. Hull's novel. Yet, at the same time, she also embraced the film 
and called it a godsend in her biography of Rudy. As I illustrated in my book, Rambova not only memorialized her lover with this illustration of him dressed as the sheep, she and their mutual friend Paul Ivano took roles as extras in the movie itself. What is the explanation for this paradox? Why would an intelligent woman say one thing and then turn around and do another? My answer is that there is something higher, more psychological and even religious that attracted Rambova beyond the sexual undertones that energized the book and the film. My proposition is that it was the archetypal and mythological aspects of the role that motivated Rambova as she wrapped her lover in exotica in movie after movie, fortifying in him the archetype of the hero, rising from an exotic land, rescuing distressed females. I root my argument in the facts of her life. At an early age, Natasha Rambova, born Winifred Shaughnessy in Salt Lake City, was deprived of a strong male figure in her life, and she spent the rest of her years searching for it. Rambova's mother divorced her father, a colonel and a Civil War veteran, when the child was only three. Thereafter, her nuclear family was primarily female, constituted by her mother, an aunt, and female cousins. This was not all that unusual, for her mother's family had been Mormon pioneers and the tradition of multiple wives creating community under the protection and governance of a distance, distant patriarch had been codified by tradition in Utah. While still a child, young Winifred was sent to Europe to study in, a, in an exclusive school for girls named Leatherhead Court outside of London. It was a lonely experience, one that scarred her emotional life, even as her intellectual life excelled. She recalled that she immersed herself in mythology and art in order to assuage the loneliness of those years. Quote, my interest in mythology and legend began as a child, as I never read any other kind of book, end quote. Greek and Roman mythology, Nordic legends, Arabian tales, nothing escaped her attention as she tried to satisfy her insatiable need to lose herself in fantasy and fable. Summers were spent in France under the watchful eye of her aunt by marriage, the famous Elsie de Wolf, whose Villa Trianon in Versailles was a veritable salon for cre uh, celebrated figures and dignitaries, artists from all over Europe. The young girl excelled in languages and in drawing, and she took dancing lessons at the Paris Opera. All the while, she was introduced to some of the leading luminaries in the world of art. The roadmap was set as the girl matured into a woman. One could have predicted that the first love in her life would be a man from the exotic East, the Russian dancer Theodore Kozlov, for whom she designed sets and costumes while he bedded her. He changed her name from Winifred Shaughnessy to Natasha Rambova. He had her perform on stage and teach in his ballet school, making her think that she could be his alone even as he maintained a wife and a child in a foreign country and treated the rest of his female staff, even some of his adolescent students, as his private harem. While Rambova was increasingly disappointed by the infidelity of her lover, she found solace and inspiration in art. She designed the costumes and stage settings for the troupe, and in this emotionally difficult time in her life, when she was described by others as withdrawn and weeping, she was counseled by one of Kozlov's other lovers, Vera Fredova, seen here in the furry costume, who told her wisely, love comes and goes, my dear, but art endures forever. When not touring with Kozlov's Imperial Russian Ballet, Rambova engaged in other projects. She designed a coloring book for children using mythological figures as the embodiment of certain colors. Here for the color brown, she posed the god Vulcan with his anvil in the same pose as the artist Ang posed Zeus in this famous 19th century painting. And in this design for the color red, Rambova posed the god of war, Mars, in a similar pose to that of the famous Apollo Belvedere in the Vatican. Art, archetypes, and myth were the staples of her life as a designer. She had a keen ability to look at the art masterpieces of the past and reinterpret them in a meaningful way for the present. 
This would be noted in her career as a Hollywood designer and later in life when she became an Egyptologist and interpreted for contemporary readers the mythology of the past that had been displayed on the walls of ancient tombs. The conflict between Ramboa's artistic life often collided with the emotional yearnings uh, she sought from the men with whom she shared her bed. Even while he betrayed her, Ramboba draped Kozlov, her lover, in exotic costumes that accentuated his physique. Her designs were eye-popping and often fantastic. They made their way into the films of Cecil B. DeMille, films like The Woman God Forgot and Forbidden Fruit, films in which Theodore Kozlov was featured prominently. Kozlov took credit for her designs as he befriended the director, spending weekends with DeMille as they went hunting and whoring at DeMille's country estate called Paradise. Ramboba's art historical training can be referenced even here. In DeMille's cinematic interpretation of the Cinderella story, Forbidden Fruit, Ramboba fashioned the fairy godmother's costume on the prototype found in the Mater Dolorosa imagery of popular piety. And her innovation in design produced a transformed heroine who wears a ball gown based on 18th century court costume, except that this one is illuminated by electric lights. In a sense, the actress Alla Nazimova became Rambova's own fairy godmother when the Russian actress discovered Natasha's talent. She hired her on the spot, releasing Rambova from the physical and psychological and artistic bondage Kozlov had imposed upon her. When Natasha packed up her things to leave, Kozlov, res his response was to shoot her in the leg. One wonders whether or not Rambova learned any lesson about love from this encounter, but one can accurately surmise from this incident that she was becoming more confirmed in the idea that art and not amour would be her ticket to a life fulfilled. While serving as Nazimova's art director for such films as Billions, Aphrodite, Madame Peacock, Camille, and Salome, Rambova's knowledge of the latest developments in design mingled with her inventive twist in repli replicating images from the past. Here we see the theater set for Camille. Its staircase and torchères have been inspired by Hans Poltzig's 1919 design for a Max Reinhardt theater. Similarly, Nazimova's grand um, kimono, oh, this is also from Camille, this is coming from a, um, uh, a, a Ruhlman design that was featured in the movie Camille. And for Salome, Nazimova's grand kimono in the final scene was derived from the peacock dress designed by Aubrey Beardsley, who illustrated Oscar Wilde's play nearly 30 years before. It should be noted that not all of Rambova's designs were unilaterally accepted by her collaboration with Nazimova. Here Rambova poses herself in a costume rejected for the Dance of the Seven Veils in the film Salome. The designer has allowed the photographer Edward Weston to capture the mystery of the veiled figure. Nazimova, on the other hand, was very proud of her life physique. She wanted to show it off and felt that this costume was too complex and it inhibited her exposition. Instead, she had the designer compliment her figure in a white tube dress and use the sheer veil as a dance prop. Rambova's designs enhanced the looks of the aging actress. They gave her film some of the most memorable imagery in the history of cinema. This brings us to Rudolph Valentino and his lasting image in Hollywood film. But I feel that any discussion of Valentino needs to be placed in the context of the other men that Natasha Rambova loved and worked with. As we have seen, her designs for the Russian-born Kozlov, like those for Nazimova, made the aging Russian dancer look younger and more energetic in, on stage and in film. She adorned him in costumes that kept his exotic allure alive. Their relationship ended in violence. The Russian-born artist was younger than Rambova, but matched her intellect. He was the son of Nicholas Rorich, a painter and mystic who was the only artist ever nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Their relationship ended when Svetislav was called to India by his father. He never returned. The fourth great love of her life, seen there at the end, became her second husband, Alvaro de Ursaiz. He was a Spanish nobleman who shared her love of archaeology. 
Yet their relationship soon became stressed by the forced separation caused by the conflicts of the Spanish Civil War. It ended when Alvaro fell in love with another woman during that separation. He annulled his marriage to Rambova and married the Duchess of Villahermosa, thus elevating Alvaro's status from count to duke. It can be said that Rambova only fell in love with men who had foreign accents. Here we have two Russians, a Spaniard, and an Italian. All four men were handsome. All four men were vain. Two of them, Valentino and Rorich, prided themselves for the elegance of their wardrobe. Here we see Svetislav Rorich with his father, Nicholas. Two of her lovers were amateur archaeologists. Alvaro loved investigating the ancient tombs of Egypt, while Svetislav explored the ancient temples of India. Three of her lovers indulged in painting. Valentino was only a clumsy beginner, but he was trying. Kozlov had a natural talent for sketching, but it was Svetislav Rorich who excelled at art, following in his father's footsteps. His portrait of Rambova seen here is a lasting testimony to their short but exhilarating affair. Of all her lovers, Rambova exercised her greatest influence on Valentino. His athletic body became the object that she fashioned with a daring, stylish, and sometimes outlandish adornment. In the words of Emily Leiter, quote, From the start, Natasha used Valentino as her personal mannequin, turning his head and body into a canvas for her art. Rambova helped transform Valentino from the mustached villain of his earlier acting career into the polished and pomaded leading man he was to become. She catapulted him into a mode of style and costumed elegance that became his legacy. But before the polish and the pageantry comes evidence of their physical passion. Paul Ivanov recalled how Natasha would pass out by the intensity of Valentino's lovemaking. Rudy looks best in the nude, declared Rambova, and as their love affair was launched, he was photographed and filmed accordingly. Images of Valentino in the nude first appear when his relationship with Rambova commences. That she was responsible for this turn of events is apparent by the art historical and antiquarian intelligence of his poses. Here he is photographed as the god Pan, an agrarian deity and renowned for sexual prowess. The animal magnetism that Rambova experienced in her lover becomes the inspiration that she weds to mythological history. But there is something more here than mythology, for Rambova had seen this motif spring previously in the world of art and the world of dance. In 1912, Diaghilev's Ballet Russe had presented the Afternoon of the Fawn, which took Europe by storm. The costume seen here that Leon Bax devised for its star Nijinsky is here adapted by Rambova for Rudolf Valentino. It is the first instance of highbrow art intersecting with the career of the immigrant actor. Its exotic flavor conforms to what Galen Studlar claims characterized the American woman's emerging desires. What art historians have labeled the male gaze, that is, male artists creating imagery focused on female nudity for the pleasure of other male observers, is here reversed. For here we have a female artist, Rambova, focusing on the nudity of her male lover, Valentino, and disseminating it for the pleasure of other female gazers. That the origin of this inspiration is also embedded in the homosexual milieu that bonded Diaghilev to Nijinsky generates some controversy. Namely, whether the iconography connected with Valentino is the domain of a female heterosexual gaze or the male homosexual gaze, or both. The issue has sparked an emotional tug of war that persists to this day. While it is easy to understand Rambova's coupling of her Italian model to an archetype inherited from the Greco-Roman past, it is more startling to see her fuse his physique to a cultural myth of the American West, the noble savage, the American Indian. Yes, the pose allows for ample nudity, which I conjecture was Rambova's aim in the first place but she has turned it into something more palatable for the American taste. The image connotes wildness, and it is as associated with nature in the United States as that of Pan for Europeans. That Rambova was born in the American West, that her family had been part of its colonization, 
underscores the rationale for choosing such a motif. But the excuse that the poses were supernaturally inspired by a spirit guide who counseled the Valentinos obfuscates the fact that there are art historical precedents here that Rambova would have known. Rudy's pose is based upon a sculpture called Appeal to the Great Spirit that was created by Utah-born artist Cyrus Dallin. Dallin came from a Mormon pioneer family, as had Rambova. He also fashioned the statue of the angel Moroni that stands atop the Great Salt Lake City Temple. Rambova's great-grandfather, Heber C. Kimball, had laid the cornerstone to that temple. The sculpture of an Indian praying was cast in Paris in 1909 and won a gold medal for its exhibition in the Paris Salon at that same time that Rambova was a ballet student at the Paris Opera. The sculptor, uh, James Earl Frazier, created this doleful image of an Indian brave exhausted by his battle to stop white settlers from infringing upon his native territory. Called End of the Trail, it was fashioned for the 1915 Pan Pacific International Exposition held in San Francisco. Rambova was living in that city with her mother at the same time, having returned home at the advent of World War I. Recently, some of Rambova's life drawing sketches have surfaced, and it is interesting to see how similar they are to some of the motion picture stills released from films made by Valentino. Male nudity was not only an erotic element in Rambova's love life, it was an artistic and academic discipline as well, and she did not hesitate to study and promote uh, in her sketches and in the films she designed this uh, material. Thus, it is not surprising that Rambova's gaze, which in turn becomes the emergent female gaze in cinematic audiences of the 1920s, focuses on Valentino's form in movies where Rambova exercised artistic control. The reporter Adela Rogers St. John Johns uh, reported this view when she said that the lure of Valentino is wholly, entirely, and obviously the lure of the flesh. In The Young Raja, Rambova gave the spectators lots of flesh when she draped him in little more than pearls. And in Monsieur Beaucaire and in Blood and Sand, there are extensive dressing scenes focusing on Valentino's physique. Here in the scene from The Young Raja, she again went back to art historical sources and created for the film an iconography celebrated in Hindu mythology. Rudi is posing here as the deity Vishnu, one of the five primary forms of God in Hindu mythology. That her artistry and taste dominated the man is evidenced most especially in those inventive cases where her creation looks totally absurd. Here in a costume designed for the young Raja, Valentino sports a turban with an explosion of pearls emanating from the side of his head. In instances like this, Rambova's miscalculation would be used by her critics against her. Just as the movie Monsieur Beaucaire would become her artistic Waterloo when some declared that she had effeminized Valentino, hiding his masculinity underneath a wardrobe of satin costumes and powdered wigs. But the desire to embark upon a project that would invoke all things Dizuitienne was not just her idea, for he, who was partially French himself, loved to visit the Chateau Jouin les Pins, the home of her adoptive father, Richard Hudnut, where sophisticated French culture was enshrined. Furthermore, the biographical influence of Rambova's adolescence colors this project for the years that she spent at Versailles with Elsie de Wolfe whose favorite artist was Fragonard. This is the painting by Fragonard called The Swing. This cannot be overlooked for the setting and the artistic and thematic tone of Monsieur Beaucaire, a film that received almost universal acclaim when it was first released, a film that is now crying out to be restored. Rambova's pride was hurt whenever criticism was leveled against her art. Some of the farmers of God's country had taken unkindly to the white wigs, she sniffed. The elitism in her statement was repeated later when she complained about her husband being sent fan mail from girls living in Oshkosh and Kalamazoo. Yet the lover she had taken as her own in the privacy of her bedroom necessarily had to be shared with others when she helped to project his image onto the silver screen. The Latin lover had been born in the American cinema and in a few years, the public and the managers and the distributors and the producers 
all got between the couple and pried them apart. Originally, Rudy, whom she likened to a man-child, was besotted with Natasha. She mothered him and managed him and dressed him for his films until he reached a point in his career where he decided he could only advance forward by signing a contract with United Artists that would exclude her involvement. She was not present for the signing. And when he went on his own and signed it, he was symbolically destroying their relationship in the act, for the marriage had now become based as much on art as it had been on physical attraction. As we know, Rambova divorced Valentino in January of 1926, and he was dead eight months later of a perforated ulcer. That she felt responsible for his untimely death by leaving him is evidenced by her immersion into spiritualism and the amount of pages devoted to the consoling words of his departed spirit that her cathartic biography of him presented. Afterwards, when she took up residence in New York and pursued a career on the Broadway stage, she met the man whom I am convinced was the true love of her life, Svetislav Rorich. He made up for those things that she found lacking in Valentino. Although he was seven years her junior, she did not find him childlike as she had found Rudy. He had come to America to help manage his father's business. His father, Nicholas Rorich, first gained fame as a designer for the Ballet Russe. The elder Rorich engaged in theological and artistic pursuits was considered something of a mystic and established the Master Institute in New York City where all the artistic media could be engaged in as avenues to the divine principle that he believed was the source of all religion. The Russian-born Svetislav had been educated in painting at London's Royal Academy and pursued further studies at Harvard University. He loved animals, was interested in philosophy, and explored ancient cultures. What is interesting is the fact that Svetislav Rorich posed in guises made famous by the Latin lover. Here he poses as the Sheik, the same year the movie came out and before he ever met Natasha Rambova. Svetislav posed himself as a turbaned Raja, although he actually made it to India where his father established his home, while Valentino never got beyond the Hollywood studio lot. Rorich also posed in Chinese garb the same year this publicity photo was released by Valentino. What Rorich saw in himself vis-a-vis -vis Valentino is difficult to say, but it would seem that these Orientalist costumes were more authentic to Svetislav, whose family traversed Asia and planted lasting roots there. Rambova found Rorich compelling. She moved into the master building on Riverside Drive, a 29-story skyscraper acquired by Nicholas Rorich, where artists and scholars could live in low-rent apartments form a community, and seek answers to metaphysical questions. There she and Svetislav Rorich became lovers. They planned to get married. They also planned to manage a school called the Museum of Religion and Philosophy that would bring all the arts together in a quest for the divine. Meanwhile, the elder Rorich had relocated the rest of his family in India, leaving Svetislav in charge of his American interests. As you can see printed here, Svetislav Rorich would act as the institution's president while Rambova was appointed secretary treasurer. Concerts, recitals, exhibitions, lectures, dramatic performances, radio talks, and even motion pictures were projects that would be sponsored by the school. All faiths would come under the institution's study, and yet the plan extended to esoteric groups as well. The paranormal, even secret societies, would be part of their investigation. Nothing would escape their study as they penetrated the mysteries through various art forms. Svetislav Rorich would teach courses in ancient art, and Rambova planned to teach courses in drama. The institution planned to open in January of 1931. But the dream was short-lived. Some of the female board members became jealous of Rambova's love affair with Svetislav, and they reported their concerns to his father back in India. Nicholas Rorich did not approve of his son getting involved with a woman who was reportedly tainted by the values of Hollywood. He canceled his son's position at the master building and ordered him back to India. These portraits of Nicholas Rorich and Natasha Rambova were both painted by Svetislav. He was forced to choose between his father's wishes and his lover's dreams. He chose his father, deserted his fiancée, and retreated to India. Rambova was devastated. In her anger, she threatened to sue Svetislav for breach of contract. 
Ironically, Svetoslav eventually did marry, and she was none other than India's premier film star, Davika Rani. Apparently, the elder Rorich had no objections this time. What is interesting is the fact that Davika Rani looked exactly like Natasha Rambova. Just as Svetoslav had once posed in oriental garb that mim mimicked Valentino's film career, so did Davika Rani continue to remind Svetoslav of his former love, that tainted icon of ho Hollywood glamour. As was her pattern in life, Rambova fled the difficult situation and took residence in Spain. While Valentino's manager, George Ullman, once likened Rambova to Cleopatra, it would seem that her charms were still able to exercise a fascination over men. Count Alvaro de Ursaiz became her fourth lover and her second husband. Because of her visit to Egypt with Ursaiz, she was able to see the course that would envelop the remaining years of her life. On Egypt, she wrote, I felt as if I had at last returned home. The first few days I was there, I couldn't stop the tears streaming from my eyes. It was not sadness, but some emotional impact from the past, a returning to a place once loved after too long a time. After the Spanish Civil War, a second divorce and a heart attack, Rambova's life became increasingly intellectual and spiritual. She studied in London with Egyptologist S.R.K. Glenville and returned to Egypt in 1946 to study symbols and system beliefs. She teamed up with Dr. Alexandre Pienkov in further expeditions to help him edit and write his work on mythological papyri. By this time, her affairs were strictly intellectual, but her past reputation preceded her. Madame Pienkov felt very uneasy whenever her husband was left alone with his celebrated colleague. More than 30 years after she had toured America with a Latin lover, an idea born in no small part due to her own artistic efforts, she would look back at those Hollywood years as important, for they taught her a lesson about the false illusions of glamour, as distinct from beauty, which she now saw as ultimately a spiritual quest. Her last years were celibate and ascetic, burdened by numerous infirmities. But it was in that state that she discovered that corporeal love no longer seemed important to her. For one who was in her lifetime the object of great physical passion, she now saw the true fulfillment of her mythological and artistic journey. She wrote her secretary saying, I have seen that smile of divinity which warms and breaks your heart as well. It is that smile, my dear, which makes all the thorns of the way not only bearable but blessed. This sacred glimpse of love in all its divine purity is that by which we can distinguish between divine and human love. When one has contact contacted this source of love, the human counterpart is poor indeed. Thank you.